Well, since everyone is here, we should get started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first workshop of NASA GMAT at the Ocean Science and Technique Academy. Uh, so we would like to extend special thanks to our guest of honor, Professor Nigel Finister. Doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really, uh, really pleased to, to, uh, to be with you today. I wish I wish I could be in Cairo, but today the uh, the, the situation obviously prevents it. Maybe some other time. But uh, uh, welcome to everyone. Um, so my uh, my role at the University of Leicester is a, as a space scientist. So I'm part of the ESA Juice mission to Jupiter. But I also teach um, astrodynamics. I'm, I'm responsible for a, a, a master's course in um, in space flight systems, and um, a particular interest of mine is in is in orbital mechanics <clears throat> and over the past few years we've been adopting a, a piece of software called gmat uh in our both in our research and in our teaching and um so today's session is really to to introduce you to that in in the hope that you might find it a, a very helpful tool to support your own studies and perhaps in in your uh, in, in projects um and to use it as a way of exploring some fundamental concepts in in orbital mechanics. So some of you may already be very familiar with with orbital mechanics, and for those perhaps what I'm going to talk about at the beginning might be a, a bit of revision. But I thought it would be useful just to go through some really basic concepts so that we make sure everybody is is on the same page as we say here. So everybody's starting at the same level. Um, so to begin with, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to stop uh, showing my webcam, which which is probably good for everybody involved, and uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'm going to share my desktop. Um, let me just go there. I can share that. Uh, so, Professor Mohammed, can you just confirm that you can see my desktop there? Yeah, it's perfect. That's brilliant. Okay, so. Um, right, so we, we are going to, to get very soon into the, the process of actually working with GMAT. Um, but I, I think it's useful to, uh, to be able to just think about the fundamentals uh, to begin with. So I want to set the scene uh, and, and explain what GMAT is, and then we'll look at some, some, some astrodynamics concepts. So GMAT stands for the General Mission Analysis Tool. And it's a it's a development which is led by NASA, but in co in collaboration with uh, with industry, um, it's open source code, and it was developed to support uh, space missions. So, this uh, this software is not just a tool for simulation, um, and I think I think it's really important to understand that it is actually used to plan and analyze real space missions. So if you look um, in the in the literature uh, at, at missions like ACE, SOHO, which is a solar mission, MAVEN is a Mars mission, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, um, GMAT has been involved in, in designing uh, and operating all of these missions. Um, so it's a, it's a validated tool. And in, in space science and in any form of, of um, uh, engineering project, uh, validation is really important. We need to know that the outputs of the software tools and the models that we use are actually in agreement with with what happens in reality. So uh, so GMAT is validated. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to to stay inside the GMAT software. And, and I hope that you've all by now downloaded and, and installed and checked that software. But um, there are interfaces with other external um, tools. So, for example, if you use MATLAB or if you use Python, then you can interface those tools with GMAT. So you can pass things from Python into GMAT and you can pass values from GMAT back out to Python or MATLAB or, or whichever other system you want to use. So. Um, uh, so it's very extensible. There are lots of application uh, program interfaces under development, lots of plugins, 
different ways of using the system. So we're going to stay mainly within the, the GUI, the graphical user interface. Um, but we'll look at scripts um, as a way of getting into more uh, sophisticated parts of, of GMAT. And GMAT comes with a number of uh, model subsystems. And, and I'll take you through this. So uh, there are models that, that uh, deal with spacecraft dynamics. They deal with the space environment. They deal with mathematical estimation and, and propagation. So uh, I'll explain what all of these terms mean. Um, OK, um, so I want to move on just to and, and this is really basic. OK, so please, please do not be don't feel insulted if this is way, way kind of back in, in, in the history of your learning. But I just want to make sure that we set the scene properly. So. Isaac Newton um, uh, developed three laws of planetary motion. Newton came from a house about 20 miles from where I'm, I'm speaking now, uh, and the, the famous apple tree. In fact, I have a, a tree, an apple tree in my garden that was grown from, from one of the apple pips from Newton's uh, garden. Um, so Newton's three laws of motion, you all are familiar with. So every object continues in a state of rest or uniform motion in a straight line unless it's acted upon by some external force. When there is an external force, then the change in motion is, is proportional to that force and in the direction that the force is, uh, is acting. And to every action, there is an, uh, uh, an equal and opposite reaction. So I hope that's, that's, that's familiar to everybody. Um, Kepler's laws of planetary motion are really a consequence of, of Newton. So you can prove Kepler's laws from, uh, from Newton's laws. And we do that in the courses that I, that I run. Um, but uh, I just want to make sure that everybody's happy with this. Kepler, of course, was, was concerned only with planets. He wasn't interested in spacecraft because there were no spacecraft in Kepler's time. Uh, but so every um, planet orbits in an ellipse with the sun at one focus of the ellipse uh, and then we have the uh, the line joining the planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times that's really important because what it tells us is that the closer the planet is to the sun the faster it must be moving in order for this area swept out to be equal uh, in time throughout the orbit so we'll see a consequence of that in GMAT. And finally, the square of the period of the planet is proportional to the cube of its mean distance from the sun. So that's a relationship between orbital radius and uh, orbital period. So these things apply to spacecraft orbits. Um, so orbit that we're going to deal with in GMAT, um, as in reality, these are all conic sections. So every orbit that we uh, that we consider is a conic section. So it's a, a member of a family of shapes that can all be produced by taking a slice through a cone. Um, so we go from circular orbits here. So that's a slice which is perpendicular to the cone's axis. When we when we tilt that slice a little, we get an ellipse. If we tilt it enough, we get uh, a parabola. So that's the boundary case of an orbit that is open. And if we tilt it even further, we get a hyperbola, and that's a, a, an example of a trajectory that is an interplanetary trajectory. So the circle and the ellipse are closed orbits. So the, the spacecraft uh, carries on orbiting the, the gravitating body. The parabola and the hyperbola are um, uh, open. So these are these are escape. Now, uh, maybe maybe I can I can ask somebody to uh, to answer a question. In reality, even though all of these four orbits are um, are possible, they're physically possible. We really only ever see elliptical orbits and hyperbolic orbits. Um, does anybody know why that is? Why don't we really see parabolic and circular orbits in in reality? Okay, maybe, maybe I'll leave that as a as a question to think about, and we'll come back to it uh, to, towards the end. 
Okay, well, as I say, I, I really want to get into to GMAT because I'm sure that's why you've all joined this session. So I, I just want to be uh, to, to introduce some equations that we are going to test. So the first equation is the equation of motion for uh, the, the simplest case of, of orbital uh, behaviors. So this is what we call the restricted two-body problem. Um, I, don't, I don't expect people to go through this and derive it in real time. I just want to point to you the key uh, results. So the restricted two-body problem is a one in which we consider one body to be the, the dominating gravitating body and the second body to have negligible mass. And we consider that only gravity is acting on the, on the second body. And we consider that the gravitating body is perfectly uh, spherical and uniformly dense. And that means that the gravitational field is completely radial and that leads to um, this result so this is the result that Kepler um, observed so uh, the solutions to the equations that we get when we make that assumption are uh, a set of relationships that describe a conic section so here is our orbit it's it's elliptical the earth I'm going to concentrate on earth orbits uh, the earth is at the is at one focus r is the radial distance between the earth and the spacecraft nu is is an angle and it produces the angular position of the spacecraft with respect to the closest approach which is called the periapsis and the relationship is that r is equal to a which is the semi-major axis so that's half the long axis of the of the ellipse multiplied by one minus e squared what is what is e e is the eccentricity and I can get the eccentricity by considering the shape. So E describes the amount of flattening of the ellipse. So an eccentricity of zero means completely circular. Um, if, I, if I want to calculate the eccentricity, I take the, the radius of apoapsis, so the distance from the center of the Earth to the furthest point, and I subtract from that the distance from the center of the Earth to the closest point so that's ra minus rp apoapsis minus periapsis and i divide that by ra plus rp the sum of these two distances so you can see straight away that if i have a circular orbit periapsis and apoapsis must be uh, the same they're, they're the same value so ra minus rp is equal to zero therefore the eccentricity of a circular orbit is zero so I, I hope this is this is making sense so far. Um, we're going to use GMAT to to test this. Um, any questions at this point? Okay. That sounds, that sounds good. That sounds like the silence of contentment. So we'll we'll continue. Um, okay. Uh, we can derive that equation by using geometry, by the way, but we but we won't today. Now, the other uh, key equation that I want to introduce before we before we open GMAT is this one. So this is known as the vis viva equation, and it describes the balance of energy in a spacecraft orbit. So you might recognize this. So we we're not going to derive it today. I just want to to make sure that you're uh, familiar with it. So V is the velocity of the spacecraft. G is the universal gravitational constant. M is the mass of the gravitating body of the Earth in this case. And A is the semi-major axis. R is the instantaneous distance, as we've already seen, between the planet and the, and the spacecraft. So if you think about this, you can see that this is actually um, kinetic energy. So V squared over 2. So that's the kinetic energy per unit mass of the spacecraft. Um, this is the potential energy per unit mass of the spacecraft. And this is the total energy per unit mass. So that's why we call this the specific mechanical energy. Specific meaning that it's per unit mass. And we're going to consider what this means in terms of, of GMAT. Okay, so enough of the preamble. We're going to now uh, launch the, the software. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to just move my my presentation across, and uh, I've already started up my my GMAT session, um, and I, I I can see that I've got quite an uninspiring window here. 
Um, and this is the main GMAT um, control interface. So I, I would ask that everybody who's installed GMAT um, make sure you've got that running now. And I'm going to take you through uh, a little um, a little exercise. First thing I want to do is is um, introduce you to the to the structure of this window. So uh, can can you see that clearly, uh, Professor Mohammed? Is that is that clear on your screen? Yes, it's clear. Okay, great. So there are there are three tabs in in GMAT now. In my version, so I'm running on a Mac and I'm running a a, a beta version here at the minute. Um, and unfortunately, uh, one of the characteristics is that the the tabs I'm not using are really difficult to see. Uh, but we'll 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 persevere. Um, so the uh, the first tab is called resources. So resources is the place where we define everything that we're going to use in our model in our mission simulation. So we define the spacecraft, we define any um, graphical windows that we want to use, and we define any hardware, so propulsion systems, for example. So let's do that now. We'll, 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 we'll take you through this step by step. Um, I have a spacecraft um, automatically uh, defined. Um, so we're going to double click that spacecraft. And I've got a whole new window and in fact I've got a set of tabs that I can use to define the spacecraft uh, but we're going to stick with um, with orbit at the moment um, so this is where we define what we call the initial state so I can describe um, the, the orbit of a spacecraft and I, uh, and I can I can provide enough information to be able to model that orbit using an initial state and that is information that defines where it is at a particular instant in time and its velocity at that instant in time and if i know both of those things and i have a model for the forces acting upon it then i can predict its its position at, at any future point in time so the epoch format is um, the the style that we want to use to define the starting date so um by default, it, it uses Julian date, but we're well, certainly uh, I'm more used to using UTC Gregorian, so universal time Gregorian calendar. So uh, it's converted into uh, a, a more familiar looking date. So here I have the um, uh, uh, the date 1st of January 2000. So we're going to change it and we're going to change it to the 19th Oops, the 19th of March, 19 MAR, 2021. And uh, so this is universal time. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it at this time, which is sort of close to midday universal time. My coordinate system uh, is centered on the earth and it's using an an inertial coordinate system. That means it's not rotating with the Earth. It's fixed with respect to the distant stars. And it, in this case, it's the mean um, equator of date. Uh, so the state type right now is Cartesian. So it's, it's looking for initial position and velocity in terms of X, Y, Z axes. That's not necessarily how we think of, of spacecraft orbits initially we tend to think about them um, certainly at the beginning of, a, of an astrodynamics workshop in terms of that ellipse the semi-major axis the eccentricity its inclination what's its tilt with respect to the earth's equatorial plane what's its uh, okay so we'll look at these these parameters later so um, what we're going to do is we're going to set up an orbit that looks like the International Space Station's orbit. So this, the, the International Space Station's altitude varies, but let's assume about 400 kilometers. Um, the Earth's radius is 6,378. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to set the semi-major axis to 6778 kilometers, so 6,778 kilometers roughly the International Space Station height. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a circular orbit, almost, almost a circular orbit. Uh, so I'm going to assume that the eccentricity is zero. Uh, the, the inclination of the International Space Station, or, well, uh, 
I confess I've just temporarily forgotten. Uh, 51.6 degrees. So here we go. So I'm going to set the inclination to 51.6 degrees. Uh, and I'm not going to worry about these other other parameters. I'm just going to uh, apply that. Now, please, if you have GMAT running, uh, you do this as well. Um, so the values are Gregorian calendar, set it up for today. Uh, I've, I've set it to midday. Earth mean J, uh, mean equation of date, sorry, mean equation of date, Keplerian, and these are our um, orbit parameters. And don't worry about these three parameters. We'll look at those later. Um, just to highlight then that as well as the orbit, I can specify the spacecraft's attitude. How, how does it uh, behave rotationally as it, as it moves around the Earth? Uh, I can define its mass properties, uh, its drag characteristics. I can add fuel tanks. I can add a power system. Um, all of these are really sophisticated capabilities that you can use for modeling missions. But today we're just going to stick with orbit. So I'm gonna, I've clicked apply and I'm going to click OK. And this is really important because GMAT is great. Uh, now and again, it will crash. Um, uh, we also run a, a piece of software called Systems Toolkit, which is not free. It's very expensive. It does something similar. It also crashes, so um, you shouldn't feel too bad. Uh, you can you can pay for the privilege of crashing as, as well sometimes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just call this um, uh, uh, test. Well, that's not a very good name, is it? Uh, I'm gonna call this uh, Kyrosat, and uh, I'm just gonna save it on my desktop. Okay, so it's good just to get into the habit of um, of saving things occasionally. Right, so we've defined our spacecraft. Um, now uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to define a ground station. Uh, so I'm going to right click my ground station uh, folder, and I'm, we're going to say add a ground station, and we're going to add uh, Cairo. Now. Um, so I'm going to double click Cairo and uh, I'm going to give it a name. So I just changed the name here, Cairo. Um, now, uh, can anybody remind me what the latitude and longitude of Cairo is? In degrees. Feel free to open your mic. 30.04 uh, 30.04. That's latitude. No, it's three foot. Sorry, three. Sorry, of course. Yes. And longitude. Thirty-one point two three three. 31.233. Now we have to be careful that we that we have the correct uh um, no 30.04, not 30.04. 30.04, yeah. So that's the latitude. 30.04. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, and longitude 31.23. And let's assume that uh well I'm just gonna set the altitude as as uh, zero for now. Okay, so I'm gonna click apply and okay. Um, we're not going to add any further hardware, um, but I do want to look at the propagator. It's really important that we understand what the propagator is, is for. So the propagator is the engine that allows GMAT to apply correct forces to the spacecraft. So in the propagator, this is where we define the gravitational parameters of the Earth or whatever other planet we're modeling, because you can use GMAT to simulate interplanetary missions as well. We're going to stick to the Earth. So um, the, the Earth is the, the primary body. Um, now, this, is, this model is um, uh, a, a gravitational model called JGM2. Now, perhaps, perhaps somebody can tell me, have you... In your courses, have you looked at uh, the gravitation, the, the, the models which describe Earth's gravitational field and how we characterize non spherical effects? Is that is that something that you've done yet? Yeah. 
Actually, I don't know. Okay. That then then perhaps uh, perhaps I'll just show you very briefly a slide, uh, just to explain what you see in this window. So um, the clearly you know the, the at the beginning I said that we were looking at at a, a very simplified orbital. Um, model where we we assume that the Earth is perfectly spherical, but of course the Earth isn't perfectly spherical, um, and those non-spherical effects lead to um, modifications to the orbit behavior. Now um, we we won't go into this in in detail, but um, I think that some of you are probably familiar with Fourier representation of waveforms, where we can add different numbers of, of simple sinusoidal waves to represent more complex shapes. And we deal with the gravitational field of the Earth or describing the field in the same way. So by adding in different terms, we go from a simple spherical uh, representation to a much more um, uh, accurate representation of the Earth's gravitational field. So um, this is the gravitational field model. And the degree and order here, these are numbers that describe how sophisticated my model is going to be, how much fine detail I, I include. Um, I'm going to set these to zero at the minute. And that means that uh, we're, we are modeling um, uh, a perfectly spherical Earth. So degree zero, order zero, perfectly spherical Earth. I'm not going to include tides. I'm not going to include an atmosphere, but I could add an atmosphere, and, and the, there's an atmosphere here. Uh, and I could also add other point masses. So I could choose to add in the, um, the effect of the moon or the sun, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave it very simple. Okay. So we, we defined in the first part, we defined the spacecraft's position and velocity by defining the orbital parameters. Here we've now defined the, um, the forces acting upon the spacecraft. So we've really got everything that we need in order to predict the spacecraft's motion. Um, on the left hand side, this is the integrator. So this is describing the mathematical um, engine which is used to solve these equations and to, to, to produce the model. Um, we're not going to go into that today. Uh, we're going to use, we're going to leave it as default the runge cutter um, integrator um, but all, I'd say all you need to know about this is that there are certain kinds of orbits certain kinds of trajectories where different more efficient uh, integrators are better suited to solving the mathematics uh, and and this allows you to choose some of those alternatives but runge cutter is a good one to choose for a, a, a basic um, uh, orbit simulation Okay, so I've applied that already. I'm going to click OK and I'm going to save. Not much else to do at the minute. Uh, let's just look at the output window. So output is where we define how our graphics are going to look. Um, so we've got our spacecraft already in the in the output. So that will that makes sure that the spacecraft is going to be shown in the graphics. The Earth is going to be shown in the graphics. And this this defines where our initial viewpoint is. So we're using the same coordinate frame. Earth is our reference point. We're going to use a vector looking along the x axis. So that's in the equatorial plane, uh, 30,000 kilometers from the center. OK, and uh, I'm just going to add one feature. So these are options that allow us to include different features in the um in the output graphic so we're going to to add the sun line so that will will provide us a little vector that points towards the sun uh apply and okay i'm going to save it just to, in case and in the default ground track plot um we're going to add the ground station that we defined so we're going to add cairo and we click apply and OK. That's as much as we need to do in resources. So you can see that everything we've dealt with so far, you can think of as either hardware or tools that we're going to use. The tools could be mathematical uh, or graphical, but these are the things that we're going to use. Now, the next tab is 
uh, our mission. So this is where we define what the spacecraft is going to do with those resources. And we're going to keep things this really simple for, for, for the first example. I click on propagate. So propagate, a propagator is just the algorithm that um, uh, predicts and models the satellite's behavior at a future time. And we looked at the propagator. It's, it's where we define the gravitational model. So in the first part of this window, we define which propagator we want to use. Um, in, in, this, in this example, we're, we're remaining in orbit around the Earth. But if I had a mission that perhaps left the Earth and went to Mars, then I would have one propagator that was an Earth-centered propagator for the first part of the mission. I'd have a, another propagator that was a Sun-centered one for the, the journey between Earth and Mars. And then I have a third propagator, which would be a Mars centric propagator. And, I, and then I would have to choose which of those I was applying to the spacecraft at each phase. But here it's really simple. I've only got one propagator. It's the, it's the Earth one and we apply it to the spacecraft. So the second part of this window is a stopping condition. So how long do I want to model a mission? At what point should GMAT stop? And um, this is currently set up to stop after a certain amount of time. So this is mission time. This is mission elapsed time. So how many days or months of simulated mission do we want? And you can see that it's it's expressed in seconds. Um, we're going to change that a little bit. So I'm going to click on the three dots here and I'm going to change that to elapsed days. So I click on elapsed days and then I click, it's difficult to see on my screen, but hopefully here for you, I'm going to click the right hand arrow here and it moves elapsed days into the selected value box. And then I'm going to click OK. So now you can see elapsed days and I want to change this to one day. So I'm going to simulate the International Space Station for one day of mission. Apply. OK. Let's save it and let's get ready to do the simulation. So hopefully you've all you've all managed to keep pace with um, with that. Any any questions, any problems before we uh, before we run the model? Uh, OK, uh, what's the meaning of, of ellipse day? Uh, I, don't, I don't understand. Uh, the ellip the uh, uh, this one here, the the ellipticity, the eccentricity. Is that is that what you were asking about? Elapsed day, what's the meaning of Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so elapsed day just means that we are modeling, we're telling GMAT that we want to simulate the, the spacecraft uh, over one day of, um, of mission. So just elapsed days just means how many days should go by before we stop the simulation. Uh, okay. Uh, so every every mission we we can take more than one phase uh, to propagate to uh, uh, from uh, orbit to another or what? Yep. So we so we can modify and, that. So we can modify the elapsed days, but um, to to reflect di different time periods. But the other thing that we can do, we don't need to use time as a stopping condition. Um, uh, and in fact, we'll do this in a later part of the of the demonstration. Uh, but we can use other parameters. So, for example, I can tell GMAT to, um, to, to stop when the spacecraft reaches a particular point rather than to simulate for a particular amount of time. So I could, uh, I could tell it to stop when the spacecraft reaches its furthest point. So we can build up really complicated missions this way. We don't just have to use time as a, as a stopping condition. The time is a good one just to begin to explore the the system. Does that does that make sense? Okay, okay, great. Okay, so uh, elapsed days I've just set to one. Click OK, and you can see on my screen I've got this uh, blue kind of a play button. Uh, hit the play button, and I hope that you can see here uh, two windows. So I have my three dimensional window. Oh, now I've got some annotations on the screen. Now I'm not sure how I can, 
How can I clear those annotations? Uh, can I clear? Clear all drawings. Ah, there we go. Okay. Right. So here is the. Uh, oh, I'm annotating myself again. Sorry. Clear all drawings and stop. Okay. So if I hold the left mouse button down, I can move around the system. If I hold the right mouse button down and move the mouse backwards and forwards, I can move into and out of the system. And uh, I'm going to look. So it may be difficult for you to see, but on my screen, I've got a blue kind of radial grid. And that radial grid is the Earth's equatorial plane. And I've got uh, X, Y, and Z uh, axes shown in, in, in colors. Uh, so blue is Z, that points along the planetary uh, rotation axis. Um, X is red, and in fact, it's, it's very close to the sun line. So X points towards the celestial reference point. So it's the celestial equivalent of a longitude reference. And Y just makes up the orthogonal, uh, the right-angled set. So uh, this is to scale. So the first thing I say to my to my students uh, when, when we when we start looking at GMAT and we use this demonstration is just look at this and think that this is this is the entire extent of human exploration of space since the last human left the moon in 1972. This is as far as we've got uh, 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 in terms of, of crude human spacecraft. Um, so this is the orbit of the International Space Station, and we can simulate it. We can run this. So uh, if you look a little bit further down the control panel, you can see another play button here, and this starts an animation. And it, it starts off pretty fast, but we can slow the animation down using these um, fast forward and replay buttons. So I'm going to press the, 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 the left hand slow down button, and I'm going to play it again. And now we can see the International Space Station orbiting a little bit more slowly. OK, the other window that we have is the 2D ground track plot. So this is where we uh, find um, a picture of the Earth and we see the footprint, the path of the spacecraft as it, as it uh, orbits the Earth. So let's just run that so I can see the space station's path building up and once it finishes that simulation it will draw uh, the ground the, the, the ground station so let's just let it finish is anybody managing to do this has anybody uh, got the same simulation yeah. running yes yeah, the same simulation brilliant excellent yes okay. I have it too. Excellent. Okay, so um, here here we see uh, Cairo, and um, we can we can already start to do something useful with GMAT. Um, I can use an event locator. So if I right click on event locator and click on add, I can add a contact locator. And what the contact locator allows me to do is to identify when the spacecraft has a line of sight to the ground station okay uh, and i can include different bodies so i can include an occulting body so if i if i tick the earth then if the spacecraft is on the other side of the earth to cairo then clearly there's no line of sight if i don't have a um a tick here the earth will become transparent and um and that's not very useful so we'll, we'll tick Earth, we'll make Cairo the observer, and it's going to output the data to a file called contact locator one. We can change the file name, but we'll leave it as it is at the minute. And it's going to write a report. So let's run that simulation again. Every time we make a change in a parameter, we, we can't just rerun the animation. We have to recalculate. So I'm going to recalculate here. So it runs the simulation. And now we're going to look at the third of these three tabs. So we started with resources. We had a mission. 
and then we uh, we now have the output and if I look at output I can see I've got my contact locator it's really small uh, but this is a text file that gives you the time the start and the end time of each contact in the simulation so I can see that in my one day of operations there were four windows where there was a line of sight between Cairo and the space station and this gives us the um, uh, the duration of those of those opportunities those lines of sight so Professor Mohammed was telling me that you are working on a CubeSat uh, mission you could model your CubeSat within this within this system and you could use it to predict ground station passes uh, points where where the satellite will be visible to to communicate to um, one point that I just want to make before we we go much further is that um, if I look back at spacecraft I, I defined the orbital parameters for the International Space Station in, in quite an approximate way um, if you want to use this for real mission analysis or for real space station observation analysis, you need to spend a little bit more time um, finding out these parameters and, and entering them accurately. Otherwise, the predictions won't agree with reality. So you need to, to look at the current space station orbital elements and, and use those to, to populate this. Okay, So please don't think... Um, that you could use the simulation you have now to figure out when you'll next see the space station you need to do a little bit more work in this window to give very precise values and then it will work for you okay uh, any questions uh, so far okay um, so the next thing that I'd like to do is just change this orbit a little bit. Um, so I'm going to close the, the ground track plot and uh, we're going to look at the, um, the orbit view. And um, I'm going to, um, we're going to make the International Space Station orbit a little bit more elliptical. So I'm going to double click on my definition and we're going to uh, change the eccentricity. At the minute, it's a very small number. It's, it's, it's essentially zero. Um, we're going to change it to 0. Point, uh, let's say 0. 0.3 and just to avoid any collision with the planet we're going to push the semi-major axis up to 15,000 kilometers uh, so click apply and click OK and click run so my ground track looks very different but I'm more interested in what the 3D plot looks like. So here we can see that I clearly have an elliptical orbit. So I can see that the Earth is at one uh, place in that orbit. Now, we we looked at the beginning at, at Kepler's laws and we said that the planets or the, the satellite moves fastest when it's closest to the Earth. Um, I want to, to demonstrate a little it's not a problem with GMAT, but it's a feature that you need to be aware of. So we're going to run this simulation. And perhaps you can see if I, it's better if I slow it down. I don't know whether you can see that the spacecraft isn't behaving quite like uh, Kepler's laws uh, predict. Uh, it, in fact, if anything, it seems to be getting quicker when it's further away from the Earth than, than when it's close. Um, but if you look more carefully, you can see there's something else going on. Uh, look at the way the Earth rotates. The Earth rotates quicker when the space, sorry, yeah. The Earth rotates slower when the spacecraft is close to it and faster when it's further away. Okay, what's going on here is that GMAT is using some, um, uh, some very sophisticated algorithms to decide how big a step it can use um, in between evaluating the spacecraft positions. So if you want your simulations to represent the, the a more realistic Keplerian um, motion, then you need to change something in the propagator. So you need to go to your default propagator and we need to change error control to none. 
And what that does is it is adopts an, an equal step between each point in the orbit calculation. So we click apply and OK and we rerun. Now you can't tell much difference here, uh, but if you did this with a very sophisticated mission, um, it would take longer to calculate the mission uh, with this with this option um, set as it is now. Uh, let's run the simulation. So the spacecraft now slows down when it's furthest away, and when it becomes when it gets closer, it speeds up. Maybe not so obvious to you in, in that example, but if we really make this a, uh, a high eccentricity, say 0 0.5, let it calculate. Now let's take a look. So I move back, run the simulation. So slow at apoapsis, but as the spacecraft drops into periapsis the closest approach can you see that's that that really is getting um, much much faster all right so um this is this is fine it's lovely we're, we're looking at some nice graphics but really what makes gmat very useful is is its calculation the the, the models that we can use to get information out of the model uh, out of the simulation um so with the simulation that you've got now what i'd like you to do is just to go into the uh, mission tab and where you see propagate i'd like you to right click and you'll see a thing called command summary so command summary prints out a um uh, a summary of the spacecraft orbital parameters at the point where the simulation ends. Now, I, even on my screen, this this text is really tiny, um, and I don't know whether you can see it at all on on your screen. Um, but if you're if you're running your own system, then uh, you can you can do the same thing on on your simulation and uh, and get a, a view of of what's coming out. In fact, I'm going to very quickly try and take a screenshot and blow it up so that you can perhaps see it a little more clearly. So just bear with me for one moment. Um, we will go to my PowerPoint and I'll add a new slide. Uh, slide. And we'll just bring that up, Let's make that smaller. Let's crop it a little bit. Okay, uh, where have it gone? Okay, crop. I don't, I don't know why it's configured to be quite as small as it is, but uh, let's let's give it a go. Okay. All right. Okay, can you can you see that um, reasonably clearly? Yes. Okay, great. So this is um, this is the the basic output of the command summary. Now we can we can generate very detailed reports in GMAT, as I'll show you shortly. Um, but really useful because it doesn't matter how many um, uh, different sequences I have here. I can I can. I can um, ask the, the software to report the state of the spacecraft at any point in time. So this is the, the state of the spacecraft at the end of the simulation. So remember that we, um, uh, we started our simulation on, let's just double check, on the 19th of uh, March today. So our, our, our starting epoch was 19th of March at 11.59 universal time. Here we see that the at the point where the simulation ended, it was the 20th of March at 11.59. So that's the one day that we asked for. It's telling us what the position of the satellite is in Cartesian coordinates. So that that is the Cartesian uh, location of the spacecraft expressed in these X, Y, and Z axes. And it's also giving us the velocity in those axes. But 
on the right hand side it's telling us the Keplerian state so this is much more um, intuitive so the semi-major axis is unchanged the eccentricity the inclination is unchanged these parameters have changed so for example the true anomaly represents the angular position of the spacecraft at the point where the simulation ends let me go back to the um, the slide that I showed you uh, earlier on so here is the here is the elliptical orbit here is the spacecraft at a particular point in time and the true anomaly is this angle here this is a Greek letter nu uh, don't confuse it with V for velocity this is nu for uh, for true anomaly so GMAT is telling us um, sorry is telling us in this output that at the point our spacecraft stopped uh, in the simulation the true anomaly was 225 degrees so in other words if we look back at that uh, slide um, the spacecraft has gone past closest approach it's actually gone past the furthest approach because that's 180 degrees and it's somewhere around here in in the orbit um, we can tell the um, uh, the velocity so v mag is the velocity magnitude kilometers per second we can tell the radial distance from this from the center of the earth um, and this is really important because you can use it to test your um, your own understanding of astrodynamics so for example uh, if we look back at our um, fundamental equations whoops sorry if i look back at the um this equation here the trajectory equation i've i've specified my semi-major axis for the for the orbit um i know what the eccentricity is i, I set it to a half uh, and i know what new is uh because i've got it from gmat so i could plug all of those numbers in and i could calculate r and and what i would hope is that the value of r that i get from this equation matches R mag. So uh, my students, so I, 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 I use this um, in both undergraduate and, and postgraduate um, uh, courses. My, my students use GMAT as a tool to, to test their understanding of, of fundamental orbital mechanics um, in, this, in this quite simple form. And, and you can do the same. Um, likewise, we don't have enough time to, to go through example calculations, but I hope you can see how you can use it to, to do that. Likewise, when I look back at the, um, the uh, I'm sorry, the um, energy equation, um, if I know what my semi-major axis is, uh, I know what the mass of the Earth is, and I know what the gravitational constant is, um, I can work out what the velocity should be for any value of r so i could set this up in a spreadsheet and enter the, the values of m g and a and then i could vary r and i could look oops sorry i could i could check my value so i could see whether when i put in a value of r equal to r mag uh, i would look to see whether i got a velocity of v from that equation equal to v mag um, and and if you've if you've applied your your physics correctly, you should find that the two uh, agree. So it's a really helpful system for um, for working this out. And and there are other orbit uh, data outputs here. So GMAT will will summarize some particular figures of merit. So one thing we often want to know is how fast was the spacecraft moving at apoapsis and periapsis. And it will output the velocity at periapsis and apoapsis here and it, it you can see it's as we expect at the closest approach the velocity is higher it's nine kilometers per second 8.9 at, at apoapsis it's 2.9 and that's what we expect but i could use those fundamental equations and a, and a calculator or excel to try and work out the same thing okay uh any questions so far Okay, um, so I, I just want to demonstrate um, some a, 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 
another feature which is a stopping condition um so we're going to going to go back to our, our main gmat window and um we're going to go to the mission tab and we're going to change our propagate uh and uh instead of elapsed days we're going to change it to apoapsis so i'll select apoapsis and i'll move across to the selected value and i click on ok so now my my propagator is set to continue the simulation until the spacecraft reaches apoapsis and then it stops so there's no condition here um because i don't need a condition my condition is that i'm reaching apoapsis i don't it makes there's no meaning to to a number here apoapsis is the point of furthest approach that's all we need to know so i click apply i click ok and i run the simulation yep and we can see that the space the the, the simulation has now not produced a complete orbit but it has provided a, um, uh, a, a an orbit that ends at the point of, of uh, furthest approach. Um, and if I look at my command summary, this is going to be really small for you, so I'll just I'll just tell you what it says. Uh, it tells me that at the point that the spacecraft stopped, my true anomaly was 180 degrees. That's that's exactly what I expect, because again when we look back at the um uh at the fundamental equations when i find it uh the the apoapsis the point of furthest approach is 180 degrees on from from periapsis okay okay is everybody happy so far um i'm, I'm happy to take any questions at this point if if, if you're having problems with your simulation or there's just something that you want to know about what we've covered up to this point. Okay, so um, normally we spend a good sort of um, couple of afternoons just just working on uh, on that level of of definition in GMAT. Um, but I, I really want to give you some insight into how we can use GMAT as a as a useful tool for exploring mission design and that requires that we 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 don't think about the um the spacecraft simply as a as a uh, an object that we can't control but but something that's obeying the laws of orbital mechanics but in which we can apply um other forces so i'm going to do that but as i'm talking i've remembered that i, I need to show you one more thing with our with our closed orbit um so i'm going to shut this window down and um one thing first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to bring our orbit down a little bit it's it's a little bit eccentric for my next demonstration so i'll bring it down to point two and i'll bring the semi-major axis down to uh, nine thousand kilometers Oh, uh, I think we have a question. Yeah. Okay, uh, can uh, can we drag uh, add any drag force uh, in this uh, in the satellite orbit? Any drag force or perturbation force? Drag force. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, you can. And, and in fact, um, what I was going to go on to do just very briefly is is show you. Um, a couple of refinements to the orbital model that that will allow us to include that kind of effect so let, let me do that right now um, uh, so I've changed the I've changed the orbital um, semi-major axis a little bit um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to simulate the orbit for a little longer um, I'm going to switch my error control back on now because I need this to be quite efficient and I'm going to um, add well no I'm going to simulate it just like this for now but we'll we'll simulate it for two weeks so 14 days 
elapsed days, let's simulate that. Okay, elapsed days, okay. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna simulate for 14 days. And I, I hope that the effect will be, will be clear. Um, so I'm gonna save this. I, I will come to your, to, to your specific question in a moment. Um, so we're gonna simulate, it, the simulation runs we can tell whereabouts it is, uh, so it gives us the date. Um, so it's quite a long simulation. By changing that error control um, algorithm, we can speed up or slow this down. If we speed up the simulation calculation, then we will tend to, um, to end up with a very slow um, uh, simulation. Um, okay, that's finished. And, and here is my spacecraft in orbit around the Earth. I can see that my orbit is fixed with respect to the, um, the background stars. So it's an inertial um, uh, frame. The, uh, the Earth is spinning underneath. And that's, that's essentially how the, the restricted two-body problem um, results. Uh, now, you may remember that I said we were assuming a perfectly spherical Earth. And we did that by making sure that these gravity terms in the propagator were set to zero. So it, it's, it's a simple sphere. I'm going to set this to two now. And what happens when I set those orders to two is that I start to describe the non-sphericity of, um, of the Earth. But I do so uh, in a very limited way. Um, so let us bring the, um, the slides back up. Um, so here is our non-spherical Earth. This, th these data were taken by a mission called GRACE, which is a fascinating mission. Uh, we could talk a long time about how this mission worked. There's two satellites, almost identical, in identical orbits, uh, but separated by a few hundred kilometers. And they each had a... Um, an interferometer that allowed them to measure their separation with exquisite precision. And the separation varied because of gravitational variations. And by by model it by by observing the changing separation, they were able to um, to model the Earth's gravitational potential. Uh, in any case, um, the, the, the main deviation of the Earth from spherical is the um, uh, the Earth's oblateness, and, and I'm sure you all know this, the fact that the diameter of the Earth from pole to pole is is smaller than the diameter um, measured across the equator. So it's a it's not a perfect sphere; it's a flattened sphere, and that's because of the Earth's rotational uh, angular momentum and the effect um, uh, on the on the mechanics of the planet. Um, now that effect leads to a talk on the spacecraft and again i'm not going to go into this i'm not going to go into the um uh the the, the physics of the derivation uh but what what we need to know is that it the 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 earth's equatorial bulge essentially exerts a torque on the spacecraft if you've ever played with a spinning top or a gyroscope you know that when you exert a torque on the on the gyroscope it starts to wobble starts to process and this is the effect that that starts um, orbits to process. So here you can see that my orbit seems to be completely constant. But now that I've turned those um, uh, gravitational terms on, we're, we're going to be modeling this, the non-spherical uh, elliptical bulge. So we're going to run this simulation again. You can already see what's happening. No longer is the is the orbit completely fixed, uh, but we can see that the, the plane of the orbit is starting to rotate. And that's that's showing itself up as this um, as this sort of smeared uh, orbit track. So let me just let's just let it run. And oh, here we go. So if I simulate that that spacecraft moving, let's speed it up a little bit. So every orbit, the spacecraft's orbital plane is rotating ever so slightly. And this is, this is a perturbation. Uh, if we want our spacecraft to remain in the same orbital plane, 
then we have to apply some maneuvers to keep it on station. But we can also exploit this. So we can use this effect to um, create orbits that track the sun, for example, so that we, we maintain the same illumination conditions every time we cross the equator. So this is an example of a perturbation. Uh, and, and GMAT is very good at modeling perturbations. This is, the, this is probably the most important one for, uh, for general low Earth orbit. Now, the question that, that we just had, I'm sorry it's taken me a while to get to it, but the question we just had is, uh, can we, can we um, represent atmospheric drag? And the answer is absolutely we can. Um, so I, I'll show you that now. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off that, um, that gravitational uh, detail because I, I want to show you just the, the, the effect of drag. So uh, I'm going to, I've turned that to zero and I'm going to, um, I'm going to recalculate my, my orbit. Let's stop that. So let's go back. Let's recalculate first. So I want to go back to that, that initial state where I've got a nice, well-behaved orbit. Now, this orbit is actually has a, a periapsis that's quite high. And the effects of atmospheric drag are really only felt at, uh, at much lower altitudes. Let's, let's first of all um, look at our spacecraft um, uh, uh, mass properties. So this gives us the the dry mass of the of the spacecraft, uh, the the drag coefficient. So how susceptible the spacecraft is to, um, uh, to to atmospheric drag, and that is determined by the shape of the spacecraft. Um, here is the area. So this is the the, the cross sectional area of the spacecraft that that is presented to the atmosphere. So the bigger the coefficient of drag, the higher this value, and the higher this value the more susceptible to drag the spacecraft is. So the International Space Station has an absolutely enormous um, drag area. And... Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I, I don't know whether I, I don't know whether you lost me at some point there. I'm sorry. Um, okay, so uh, so we're, we're going to simulate the, um, uh, the 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 drag. So the space the space station has a very large drag area, and that's why. Uh, it, it, it tends to need to be boosted in altitude periodically because the atmospheric drag is reducing the, the orbit energy and bringing the spacecraft back down to the place it came from. Um, we're just going to stay with this. We're going to keep those values as they are. Uh, but we have to turn on the atmosphere in the propagator. So um, in drag, we, we have a choice of, uh, of atmosphere. So these are two model atmospheres that are um, commonly used in the community. Uh, M size is a, a spectroscopically um, uh, a derived model. Jackie Roberts uses a number of different information sources. We'll stick to M size for now. Um, we're gonna we we can actually read in some very sophisticated drag definitions, but we're just gonna and that's what SPAD file is. But we're just gonna stick to spherical at the moment. We can set this up. So M size um, allows us to um, vary or to reflect different um, solar conditions. So as you probably know, the, the, the density and the pressure in the atmosphere at, at high altitudes is affected by the solar state. So when the sun is very active, the atmospheric density at high altitude goes up. And that's why satellite orbit lifetimes are affected by solar state. Um, so you can reflect that in here, but 
we're just going to leave this as it is at the moment. And we're going to apply and OK. Now, let, let's first of all run the simulation as it is. Now, remember that the, the only thing I'm modeling is spherical gravity and atmospheric drag. Actually, you can start to see the effect of atmospheric drag here, but it's very, very subtle. Um, the line here is is uh, uh, blurred a little bit. It's not as sharp as it was, uh, but it's a very, very subtle effect. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the orbital uh, radius. So let's let's bring this down to about 7,000 kilometers. So I've reduced my semi-major axis. Ah, OK. Uh, so at this point, we're, we're, we're really testing the model to, to the limit. So I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to take that up a little bit more. Uh, let's let's take it down to 7,500 kilometers. Uh, OK, what we see here is the is is actually the effect of atmospheric drag. What it's telling me is that with the current um, step size, um, my my atmospheric drag effects are sufficiently large that um, the the calculation is going to become uh, in uh, unreliable. So we do have a little bit of work to do to try and modify this a little bit. Um, so seven thousand nine hundred kilometers. Let's try it again. Oh, you can really see that it's 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 struggling to um, to run that mission, and it's happening around periapsis. And the, uh, and so you know the, the reason is is very clear that around periapsis is where our atmospheric drag is becoming really significant. So my my system is starting to struggle a little bit, and the way that we would need to um, to handle that is to is to change things like the the error control steps. Um, so I'm just going to change that a little bit, and I'm going to um, modify the. Um, the semi-major axis, and let's take that up to Okay, it's really, uh, it's really struggling there now. We may have to go for a different approach. Yeah, so I so we would we need to at this point change the numerical uh, integration system to try and um, calculate this more efficiently. Um, what I what I may try to do is just adjust my orbit to try and make that a little bit cleaner. So GMAT, GMAT is not a, a black box in the sense that uh, you can just enter a value and, and, and get a solution. Sometimes you have to, to work with the mathematical configuration to try and uh, uh, um, uh, get, get the, the, the solutions to the problems you, you're, you're working. Uh, I'm just going to change this a little bit and see whether I can make it work at that point. Okay, uh, semi-major axis is 8,000. I don't want to. I don't want to spend too much time solving this one at the minute. Um, but what I will do, if we can't do this now, I will. Um, I will. I will design a little scenario that will will demonstrate this properly, and I will send it uh, to you via uh, Professor Mohammed. Um, and and that should help. No, okay. Let me just try one more time. So M size ninety. Let's just try. Let's just try an alternative model. Try exactly where it's. 
Yeah, it's because I'm 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 at a really low altitude at this point. Let's uh, let me let me reduce that eccentricity a little bit. Uh, let's let's take it to point one, uh, six, seven, seven, eight. So let's take it to uh, eight, six, eight, eighty. below 100 kilometers so why so I've got low eccentricity okay so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tune that a little bit so I'm going to push the eccentricity up just a little so I'm going to push that up to one point to, to point one five. So we're definitely getting a little bit of drag effect there. Let's let's go a little higher. So we'll push that up to uh, point two. I'm pushing my luck as I do this. One more. Okay, so the, I think the issue is that we're we're rapidly getting to a point where drag is bringing us down to very low um, altitudes, and it's running out of the the model's um, uh, parameter space. Let me just try that one. So one, one thing that we can do to, to investigate this, uh, rather than using the graphical window here, is we can add a new output. So I can add an XY plot. And in that XY plot, I can on the X axis, I can use date. So we'll just use Julian date here. And on the Y axis, we will use uh, apoapsis. So um, let's see. Okay, so let's, uh, oh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, semi-major axis, okay? So we'll use the semi-major axis and we expect the semi-major axis to change when we have atmospheric drag. So click apply and okay, and we'll run that again. Now you can see what's happening, okay? So I'm, I'm gonna, so, so our semi-major axis is reducing. Now, in the in the restricted two-body problem, that can't happen. The semi-major axis is fixed. The reason that the semi-major axis is, is is falling here is because of that atmospheric drag effect. So, hopefully, um, that that shows you that we are taking that into account. Uh, and as I've said, we, we would need to work a little bit to optimize the, the mathematical model, the integrator, um, so that it deals with, with what could be quite a severe level of, of drag. And I'm, I'm more than happy to, um, to, pr to, to produce a little scenario uh, with a little bit of explanation and, um, and I can send it out to you uh, and you can try it yourself. So to the original questioner, is that okay? Does that, does that sort of basically answer your question uh, yeah it would. okay all okay. uh, right so let's uh, save that and uh, I'm going to turn off the atmospheric drag um, function now so we'll go to the propagator and we'll Turn off the drag, so we go to non, apply, and OK. Uh, just let me let me just uh, check something before before I move on. Uh, I'm just going to see whether I have a pre-built scenario that I might be able to um, to demonstrate. Bear with me just a moment. Mm 
Okay. Yeah, I don't want to try that now. Okay. Um, let me uh, let me move on to a slightly different topic, which is uh, which is maneuvers, uh, and I'll bring up my my presentation again. Um, we're going to look at uh, the vis viva equation. So we're going to look at that um, this relationship between the the kinetic and the potential energy of the um, uh, of the of the orbit. So this is this was our vis viva uh, equation. So remember, this is the potential energy. This is the uh, sorry. This is the kinetic energy. This is the potential energy. This is the total energy of the orbit. Now we can use this. Um, to work out uh, how to do orbit transfers. So orbit transfers are maneuvers that, that allow us to, to modify the orbit from one state to another. And the, the one that I want to focus on here is, is, is called the Hohmann transfer. So the Hohmann transfer is, a, is an orbital maneuver that usually represents the most fuel efficient way of getting from one orbit altitude to another if we're using a conventional chemical propulsion system. So this is what a Hohmann transfer looks like. Um, so in this case, we start off in a low Earth uh, orbit and we want to move to this high um, Earth orbit. So what we do is we place the spacecraft into an elliptical orbit whose semi-major axis is equal to, the, um, to half of the sum of the uh, initial and final orbit radius. Okay, so this is the initial orbit radius. This is the final orbit radius. So the semi-major axis of this ellipse is just half of that dimension. Okay, now what we need to 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 do is to apply the hope the the vis viva equation to to this uh, problem. So this slide shows us how to do it. Um, and again, I, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I do just want to draw your attention to, to a couple of facts. Let's imagine we keep, uh, we, we have a spacecraft in this low altitude orbit. So it carries on going around this orbit. Um, in the, the, the common point between the initial orbit and the transfer orbit is this point A. All right. Now, if we, if we use this equation um, the radius the radial position of a spacecraft in this orbit in this circular orbit and of another spacecraft in this elliptical orbit if we evaluate their velocity at that point at that common point um, that velocity will be different they're not the same and the reason is that the semi-major axis of this orbit a is bigger than the semi-major axis of this orbit Okay. So even though the two spacecraft are orbiting the same object and they are um, at the same distance from that object, their velocities are different because, this, because the apoapsis distances are different. So if we can work out what the velocity in the circular orbit is at that point and what the velocity in the elliptical orbit is at that point, that gives us what we call a delta V, a change in velocity. And if we if we increase our circular orbit velocity by that amount, then we are on the elliptical orbit. By definition, we've we've placed the spacecraft onto this elliptical orbit. Um, and the key point is that the the direction of the burn, the maneuver, is tangential. So we we increase velocity in the direction of our instantaneous velocity. So the vis, -vi the, the vis viva equation is, is at the heart of the calculation that we use to um, uh, work out a Hohmann transfer. So we're going to do that in, in GMAT, and we can actually make GMAT calculate this uh, itself. But what I'm going to do, first of all, is take you through the, the calculation for a geostationary Earth uh, orbit. Okay. So uh, the question here is, what's the total change in velocity that we need to go from a 400 kilometer altitude circular orbit to a geostationary circular orbit? And that's an orbital radius of 42,164 kilometers. Okay. 
So this is really uh, important. Note the different units. Um, the, the, this first orbit is given in terms of an altitude. So that's a distance above the surface of the Earth. The second one is given as a radius. It's the distance from the center of the Earth. So this, I do this deliberately because it's really important when you're working on, on astrodynamics problems to be very careful about units and to make sure that you understand the units. So if you get orbital altitude and orbit radius wrong, if you get it wrong in an exam, then you lose marks, okay? If you get it wrong as a spacecraft operator, you can lose your spacecraft. So it's it's really, really critical that we that you remember this. Okay. It seems trivial, but but I can tell you that that a lot of students have lost marks in exams because they've used altitude instead of radius or vice versa. Okay. Anyway. So first question is what's the circular orbit velocity at 400 kilometers altitude? Well, if I'm in a circular orbit, my radius R is always the same as the semi-major axis A. So this equation can be rearranged. So solving V when R is equal to A gives me this nice simple relationship root mu over R. And here I've, I've started to use a little bit of shorthand. So mu is just another way of writing g times m and it's it's called the gravitational parameter so circular orbit velocity g times m is this line here so this is the universal gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of the earth r is the orbit radius so it's my 400 kilometers altitude plus the radius of the earth so around about 6370 kilometers plug the numbers in Take the square root and I get 7,671 meters per second. So at 400 kilometers altitude, the orbital velocity is about 7.7 .7 kilometers per second. Okay. I'm only going to do half of this, by the way. Um, so what is my spacecraft's orbital velocity here when it's in the elliptical orbit? Right. Well, at this point, r is no longer equal to a a is the semi-major axis of this transfer orbit r is the the radial position at at this point a so my orbital velocity at periapsis in the elliptical orbit is given by rearranging the vis viva equation i set a to the semi-major axis of my ellipse i set r equal to the orbit radius corresponding to 400 kilometers altitude. So I plug the numbers in and I find that my uh, um, radial, uh, sorry, my velocity is 10 kilometers per second. So if I take away 10 kilometers, uh, 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 if I subtract 7.67 kilometers per second from 10.07 kilometers per second, I get my velocity increment and it's, it's, it's around about 2.4 kilometers per second. So that tells me that if I give my spacecraft in its circular orbit uh, a kick of a velocity equal to 2.4 kilometers per second, then I will find that it enters an orbit whose apoapsis is equal to 4, uh, sorry, 42,164 kilometers radius. Well, that's what we're going to do now. So uh, we are going to take our original scenario and we're going to just make some, oh, where's my, I've got a GMAP window that's open, I think. Okay, so let's, uh, Bear with me a moment. Okay, so I did say, I think at the beginning, that occasionally GMAP can uh, uh, give a little crash. So let me just see if I can undo this. Oh no, it's working. It's, I had a window open. Okay, um, so we are going to change our orbital parameters. 
and uh, I'm gonna I want to introduce to you a different um, uh, reference frame um, which is a fixed reference frame and it's called a planetodetic reference frame so in planetodetic reference frames I can use um, uh, latitude and longitude as as initial starting conditions so I, I actually i'm not going to i'm not going to define my my orbit like this now but i want you to be aware that we can change if you're you know, so you're working at, a, at an oceanographic institute it's very likely that you're going to be involved in orbits where a knowledge of the spacecraft position with respect to latitude and longitude is important but you can do that through this um planetodetic frame uh, but i'm going to go back actually second thoughts so i'm going to go to keplerian back to our um original reference frame um so 400 kilometers is 6778 uh kilometers radius zero eccentricity i'm going to set the inclination to zero uh and i'm going to simulate that for one day so i'm going to change my um uh, propagator stopping conditions and I'm going to set one day. Apply. Okay, and let's run. So I can see now that my, my orbit is in the equatorial plane because the the, um, SF, the inclination is zero. And, and there it is, the red trace. Now we need to be able to make a propulsive maneuver. So we have to fit the spacecraft with, a, uh, with an engine. So I'm going to go back to resources and we're going to select hardware and uh we're going to add a um a chemical tank and a thruster so this is a chemical thruster and i'm going to define a burn so add and we're going to define an impulse of burn. So there are two options here. Impulse of burn is the one we're going to use. And that's a very simplistic approach where we simply change the spacecraft velocity by a particular value. And we do so instantaneously. So we go from seven kilometers per second to nine kilometers per second in, in one instant in time. And that means that it's quite useful for simple simulations and estimations. Now in reality, spacecraft of course don't have infinite thrust so any maneuver takes place over a, an extended period of time and that's where we use finite burns these are more complicated to calculate and model but they give us a more accurate uh, result but we've only got two hours to do all of gmat today so i'm not going to do that i'm just going to go to impulsive burn and what i'm going to do is i'm going to change the name of this burn now there's a little there's a little behavior in gmat which can be a, a bit awkward it won't let me rename anything while i've got other graphic windows open so i'm going to close these windows and now i'll rename it and i'm going to call this toi transfer orbit insertion and i'm going to double click on toi and it opens up into uh, a set of um, parameters. So the coordinate system that I'm using, its origin is at the Earth, but its axes are called VNB. V stands for velocity, N stands for normal, and B stands for binormal. So V is in the spacecraft velocity direction, N is the normal, so that's perpendicular to the orbit plane, and b is binormal so that's radial and i've got three elements here so my elements are how many kilometers per second do i want to change in the velocity direction how many in the in the in the normal and how many in the binormal uh, we've worked it out so this transfer is always in the velocity direction and the value is about 2.4 kilometers per second. So in element zero, I'm going to put 2.4 
zero, zero kilometers per second. Okay. And I don't need anything in the other two because I'm only changing my velocity in, in the velocity direction. Um, and actually, for the purposes of today, I don't even need to worry about what my engine is, how much fuel I have. I can just, from memory, I think I can just keep this off. So we just use this to change our velocity. So click apply and click OK. So I've actually got everything I need. So now I can save and I can go to the propagator. And now I need to do, I need to make some, um, some changes. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, I'm going to add a new element to the to the mission sequence. So I start off by by orbiting for a day. So I just stay in my initial orbit for one day. Nothing interesting happening there. But after that, if I right click, I can insert something new and I've got all of these functions that I can insert. Uh, and what I'm going to insert is a maneuver. And if I double click my maneuver, it allows me to select any of the um, maneuvers, any of the burns that I've defined. I've only defined one, it's TOI, it's the transfer orbit insertion. That's all I need to do. So that triggers the burn. But then um, I need to propagate again because I need to see the effects of that um, in, in the orbit. So I'm gonna add, insert, a new propagator and I'm going to propagate not for a certain amount of time but I'm going to propagate to apoapsis there we are propagate to apoapsis and I hope that apoapsis matches this distance here because we calculated that 2.4 kilometers per second would take us to 42,164 kilometers radius. Um, and I'm going to override the color. So my orbits have been red up till now, but I want to make this one a bit different so we can see the new phase. And I'm going to make it, uh, what should we make it, yellow. So we'll apply that and we'll OK. And I'm going to save it and I'm going to run it. So let's see what happens. So I'm simulating. Oh, and there we go. So zoom out a little bit and lo and behold, I can see that I've I started in my red orbit. I got one day into the mission and we did a burn and that burn has taken us out to a much higher altitude orbit. Let's just run the, the animation. So I get about 16 orbits in the circular orbit. Then we hit the burn. And we are now at apoapsis. And I can plot the, um, uh, the behavior. So in my XY plot, uh, instead of semi-major axis, I'm going to plot RMAG, the radial distance. RMAG. Apply, OK, file, save. And um, we will now run that again. Okay. So there's my plot. I can see that I'm, I'm at a constant orbital radius until I start the burn and then my um, my orbit radius goes up and I can actually use uh, I can zoom in with my with my mouse and I've got 42,328 kilometers. So we th that's that's a pretty good agreement. So 42,164 Obviously, I've used some assumptions about the, the radius of the Earth here. Um, I'm not accounting for any of the, the other effects which are going on, and yet I've got very close to that to that orbit radius. Um, so that's hardwired. Okay, so we had to do the work ourselves to, um, 
to calculate that orbit radius, uh, to, sorry, to calculate the burn to give us that radius. In the last few minutes, I, I want to introduce you to maybe one of the most powerful aspects of GMAT, which is the ability to calculate those parameters itself. Okay. Um, before I do that, I just want to point out that, of course, we, we're currently in an orbit where we're, we're going around this elliptical um, uh, loop. And we really want to be on that final circular orbit. So the way to work that out is, is the same as we did to go from circular to elliptical. We work out the difference in velocity in the circular orbit versus the transfer orbit at apoapsis. And then we give the spacecraft a delta V, a burn of that magnitude at apoapsis, and that will circularize. So you can, you can try that yourselves uh, as, a, as a little exercise after this. But what I want to do now in the last part is show you how you could get GMAT to calculate this without you having to, to go through the maths yourself. So to do that, we are going to, first of all, modify our burn. And I'm going to change 2.4 kilometers per second to zero. In other words, I'm leaving GMAT to decide what this value is. I don't want to give it a value myself. Now we go to um, mission and we're going to get rid of the propagate and we're going to get rid of the maneuver. So all I have now is that initial 60, a uh, one day worth of, of orbit. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to insert a target sequence. So a target sequence is a loop and it allows us to vary a parameter so that we achieve some condition. So to do that, we have to append. So we have to add some actions inside that target. And the sequence is as follows. It's a very it's then a maneuver. Then there's a propagate. And then finally, there's an achieve. Okay. Can you bear with me? I'm sorry, if you could bear with me for just a moment. Um, I just need to leave my desk for, for a brief moment. Sorry, everyone. Sorry, everyone, about that. Uh, one of the hazards of, uh, of doing things from, from home. Um, OK, are you all still with me? Have I lost anyone? It looks like you're still with me. OK. So we're in, we're in this loop, and we do uh, very maneuver, propagate, achieve. So let's make some sense of that. So our very is the element one which remember was our, our velocity direction in um, the transfer orbit insertion so we have to give it some limits for um, uh, for the vary so an upper and a lower limit so i'm going to allow it to start at zero kilometers per second 
and I'm going to allow it to explore values up to three kilometers per second. Apply and OK. So, so the vary tells us what the um, range of solutions um, will be. The maneuver is the transfer orbit insertion. So there's nothing else to select there. Propagate. So what I want to do is propagate to apoapsis. And then the final one is an achieve. And the achieve, uh, it's already set to um, uh, RMAG. So GMAT is fairly um, good at predicting what, what my achieve condition might be. So it's already set to use the radial distance as the goal. And my radial distance is 42,165 uh, kilometers. So let's let's look again. Um, back at the thing here, so 42,164 kilometers. That's what we wanted. So that's what we're asking GMAT to to, um, to to do for us. And then finally, after that, as I did before, I want to um, propagate a little bit further. And we're going to call this um, uh, new orbit. Ah, no, OK. No, we're not going to do that. We're just going to let it go to apoapsis. Um, so we're going to file, save. I might change the, the color again. So let's change it to yellow. And then uh, let's go. And we'll run that simulation now. And what you'll see is there's a search window comes up and you'll see GMAT trying to find a solution to the burn magnitude that gives us the, the required behavior. So here is the search. It's iterating. It's already found the solution. And there is the solution. So, oops, I'll just try and zoom in and out again. There we are. So uh, we've um, we were in our initial circular orbit. GMAT then searched and found a burn that would take it out to the required orbital radius. And then we've got a little bit of a propagation uh, uh, beyond apoapsis as the spacecraft continues along that uh, elliptical transfer. And if we look at the at the value that it found, so it converged on the required uh, radius with a burn element one whose value is 2.3975 kilometers per second so uh 2398 meters per second compared to 2399 so the difference between the um the value i wanted and the value i got at the, in, in my first example was down to a one kilometer sorry a one meter per second um three nine nine three nine seven sorry a three uh, meters per second difference in my calculated velocity so hopefully you can see that gmat is now is really powerful for for solving these problems and there's one final thing i'm going to do uh, I'm going to circularize the burn. I'm going to circularize the orbit. So without having to calculate this, we're going to get GMAT to do this. Um, so I'm going to add another burn, finite burn, and it is, um, we're going to call this one uh, FOI, final orbit insertion. So let's call this, uh, oops, Daisy, where have we gone? Let's get rid of this window. Like I say, we can't rename things with windows open, unfortunately. Uh, FOI, final orbit insertion. I leave everything um, uh, uh, unchanged there. So I just I assign a chemical thruster, that's fine. But other than that, I don't need to, to, to do anything. Um, uh, 
Sorry, I've just. I'm rushing. I'm going to delete that. It should be an impulsive burn, not a finite burn. FOI. FOI. Finite orbit insertion. That's that. Okay, so everything's zero. I don't need to set anything here. Um, what I need to do is add a new target. So I've I propagate to my apoapsis, and then we will add a new target. So my new target is I'm running very short on time. I hope I can do this in time. Uh, target. So we're going to vary. So we're going to have a vary command. Um, I have to make sure that I, I select not the transfer orbit, but now the the final orbit insertion. But it's still element one. It's the velocity direction. Uh, and I'm going to give it the same limits. Let's explore from zero to three kilometers per second. I can see I'm expecting a value about one and a half kilometers per second. But let's let's give it a bit of range there. Uh, then I do a maneuver. Oops. So my maneuver. Oops, where's it gone? Maneuver. And I my maneuver is the final orbit insertion. Apply. Okay. Uh, and then actually what we're going to do is we're going to try and use a slightly different condition. So rather than propagating, I'm just going to search for a solution that gives me an eccentricity of zero. So we'll choose because a zero eccentricity is a circular orbit. So if I can achieve a circular orbit at the apoapsis radius, then I've, I've achieved my goal. So my eccentricity is going to be equal to zero and I'll give it a little bit of tolerance. So I'll accept a solution uh, 0 0.001. And then finally, we will uh, we'll add a propagate after this so that we can see our new orbit. So I'm going to call this, uh, rename this uh, uh, final orbit. And we'll uh, allow it to propagate for, uh, let's say, one day. So let's do elapsed days. one oh let's do two um and i'm going to change the color let's make it green green oops okay that's green there we go apply okay let's save it i'm sorry i know i'm speeding up now uh, I, I just can see that we're running out of time so I want to try and show you this working. Ah, let's run. So it finds the first stage. It's already found the, the solution for the second stage. So what it did was it, it got to the first stage. It gave us our transfer orbit to... Um, sorry, my mouse is a little bit awkward. Got, it took us out to 42,165 kilometers. Then it did another burn and it found the value of that burn that gave us a circular orbit at the same radius. And when I look at that second um, target sequence, I can see that it achieved an eccentricity of almost perfectly uh, circular, 0 0.0003. Uh, and it did so with a burn that was 1.457 kilometers per second. And when I look here, my first principles calculation told me that it should be 1.457 kilometers per second. So GMAT confirms the calculation that we've got. And we got there three minutes before the end of the session. So um, I'm sorry that was a bit fast, uh, but I hope I hope you managed to, to follow the, uh, the gist of it and, um, and that that's given you an idea of, of what you can do with this system. Obviously, the system is is 
phenomenally capable. Um, so when we run this workshop in Leicester, we do so over several weeks and we get into interplanetary missions, doing flybys, uh, analyzing perturbations and much more complex maneuvers. But you know, these all use um, very similar concepts to the ones that I've, that I've gone through today. So if you understand the basic uh, framework of GMAT, um, that we've gone through today, then you can start building on it for, for, for further work. So I'm going to leave it there, but I'm very happy to take any any questions that, that you may have. Over to you. So I think everybody's either stunned or has, has gone to sleep. Any questions? <laughs> Actually, we need the, in, from five to ten minutes break. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that I hope that's been useful. It's such a great thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. That's, uh, this is this is quite open. So I think it takes people a little while, maybe, to think about how how to apply this to their own to their own work and where it might be useful. But uh, you know, the the nice thing about GMAT is that there are lots and lots of online um, uh, scenarios and tutorials. It comes with some lessons that you can use. Um, so it's uh, it's something that you can really kind of um, learn yourself. Um, and it, it's. And once you understand this, you'll also find that you can um, you can work with systems like uh, Systems Toolkit (STK), which is the kind of the industry standard, very expensive version. It looks very similar, and it does a very similar kind of thing. I see you have question from Omar. Go ahead, Omar. Yeah, I want. Say that this lecture is the greatest lecture I have ever attended. Thanks a lot for Thank your you. time. That's very kind. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to say also that if it's possible, I wish you give us some tasks to do, even if maybe all of us still not cause enough with using GMAT because this is first week we starting using it. But the best way to learn is by doing searching, got stuck, and Googling again. Yeah. So if it's possible to have some tasks to do, this will be great. Yeah, I, I, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to, to provide some sort of suggested exercises uh, to do. Um, and, you know, it, it, if I'm sure you have a very busy uh, schedule of of lectures and and workshops already, but if you wanted uh, if you wanted to do a follow up session, maybe after you've looked at those tasks, um, and I can take you through some solutions if you've had problems, then I'm sure we can organize that. That would be absolutely fine. That will be great. I agree with it. Great, brilliant. So uh, maybe maybe next week. Uh, Professor Mohammed, maybe we can have a little uh, exchange by email and, and figure out how that might how that might work. Thanks to everybody for for bearing with it and and for for the interesting questions. Thank you, okay. everyone. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot.